Hello and welcome back to the Muscle Engineering Podcast. I am your host Sotek Andre and you're listening to episode 17 which is going to be a solo episode in which like I promised I'm going to review the last two episodes, episode 15 with Berge Fagerli and episode 16 with Adel Musa and I'm going to give my um, thoughts and uh, what I consider to be the top three most important takeaways for each of these episodes. So first off, let's start with uh, episode 15, where I had the absolute honor to have uh, Berger Fagerli on the podcast to discuss his uh, recent carnivore diet experiment. And we also touched on uh, a variety of nutrition related topics, such as uh, nutrient timing and uh, synchronizing your food intake with the season or the time of the year and uh, your ancestry and so on. So first off, I wanted to uh, share uh, an unpleasant experience I had on Facebook uh, where I shared the episode in one of the most uh, prominent and one of the biggest uh, evidence-based sports nutrition groups where uh, I thought that um, nutrition-related discourse would uh, be encouraged and uh, where I have seen such discussions occur in the past. And uh, basically what happened is that uh, an admin turned off the comments saying that, well, um, basically, uh, no scientific papers, we don't care, and I should could just go with my anecdotes somewhere else. And I find it particularly sad and uh, a bit frustrating that uh, a group that's basically evidence-based and where it has that nomenclature in the description of the group itself, basically turns down any discussion that uh, doesn't have a scientific paper uh, backing it when scientific literature should only be a third of the evidence-based uh, practice and uh, the re- second two parts should be client needs and the experience of the practitioner itself and uh, the, we definitely touched on those two components in this episode so I, I, I just thought that it uh, it would be appreciated and it would spark some interesting conversation but it didn't and the comments were turned off so that was a bit sad to see and um, I find it frustrating, I guess, that um, as, a, as an opposition, I guess, to the other extreme where people just dismiss science and only value anecdotes and experience, now we are seeing these groups and these people who value science uh, jump to the other extreme and dismiss anything that is not science in the sense that they think of it, meaning that it hasn't been reviewed and hasn't been published in a journal when science, it's, well, it doesn't really have anything to do with uh, the publishing per se, it just, well, it's much more um, related to how you think about things and how you conduct your experiments. But anyway, I just, I just found it sad and I get to see more and more of these behaviors day by day and I get kind of turned off more and more by these uh, so-called evidence-based folks when they are really really not so with that out of the way let's get into the first takeaway from episode 15 and that has to do with the notion that um, just because something doesn't have scientific backing you shouldn't at least give it a try and if it works then you should definitely stick with it so in the case of this um, carnivore diet experiment and by the way that was one of the reasons why i i found the comment disabling so much more frustrating because obviously that particular uh, person hasn't listened to the episode it wasn't like we Bergen or I we just kind of started promoting this whole carnivore thing as the best thing ever that everyone should just do and no one should ever eat anything else other than uh, meat I was just curious and he was just giving his own uh, experience and uh, thoughts on the matter and nothing less and nothing more so we just wanted to give a balanced point of view from a well-known coach and practitioner and from myself uh, well a lesser known (laughs) and probably slightly worse coach and practitioner but still someone who has um, I hope so by this point has proven that he is uh, very open to new ideas and uh, new thoughts and point of views even though science might not be there yet. In the case of the carnivore diet, um, as far as I know, there aren't really too many. I think there are some, because I've seen in some other groups people referencing um, some literature, but uh, like I said, I'm not 
that interested in it and if someone is going to try it they probably will anyway and they are not particularly interested in the science and this ties back to the point i'm trying to make here if it works it works so even if it isn't supported by science it doesn't really matter as long as you're feeling you're feeling well your, your performance is good and um, hopefully your blood um, your blood tests are also looking good and in the opposite way if someone isn't really feeling well on something whether that's the carnivore diet or not it doesn't really matter that science says that it is supposed to be good if you're not feeling well on it or <laughs> you're not performing well, you are lethargic or something like that, then you should just stop doing whatever that is and try something else. I don't care what that is, ketogenic diet, intermittent fasting, six meals a day, high carb, low carb, high fat, low fat, high protein, low protein, gluten free, heck, even a bulletproof coffee or it's really the last thing that I'm trying to promote here. But I know some people love it and if it works for them, good for them. So. As long as someone doesn't turn it into a religion and start uh, trying to convert others to their newfound re dietary religion, I'm, I'm totally fine with it. So don't be afraid to experiment with new things and uh, if it works for you, stick with it. Point number two is somewhat related to it and um, it has to do with this notion that uh, many, I think, too evidence-based folks promote that, well, especially when it comes to dieting, this notion that if you can't see yourself doing this uh, five or ten years from now, then you shouldn't even bother with it. And in a way, I see the value in uh, trying to promote something that can be sustained long term. However, if you think about it logically, even a calorie deficit, let's say someone is overweight and they need to lose fat. Okay, great. We, they have to go into a calorie deficit. But are you really saying that, because based on that uh, logic, you're saying that, well, if you can't see yourself sustain that calorie deficit ten years from now, you shouldn't even bother with it. I mean, wait a second, if it's just a guy who has to, or a person who has to lose a couple of pounds, maybe even if they have to lose a hundred pounds, I mean, is that going to take them, what, a couple of years? And then what, they should just start to that? <laughs> because if you take the advice uh, at face value, it doesn't make much sense, does it? So I think this again is um, a reaction to the other extreme of people doing completely unsustainable things and trying out a new fad every month. And in that sense, yes, it's probably a better advice, but still, just because something isn't um, sustainable long term, that doesn't mean that it can't be valuable in the short term. So the kind of our diet is the perfect example for this. And Berger himself mentioned that this is probably something that you won't sustain or won't stick to years and years and years, even though there are some people who do. But still, even though you might not do that, it can still be valuable to try it for a month or two or three or something like that and um, perhaps it can help you alleviate some other health issues you've been experiencing and can make a more uh, balanced uh, dietary approach work better. In the same way, training works the same fashion. I mean, just because a super high volume phase might not be sustainable 10 years from now or um, might not be sustainable continuously for decades, that doesn't mean that you can do two or three or four months of that or something like that and then go back to a more uh, moderate training approach. And if you think about it, life is all about uh, these trade-offs. I mean, the whole notion of balance, in my view, and from what I heard from really successful people, doesn't really exist. There always has to be something that gets the priority and some other things that get deprioritized. So in the same way, just because, for example, working 80 hours or 100 hours per week isn't really sustainable, that doesn't mean that you won't be forced for a couple of weeks or months to do that. So I don't think that advice is helpful. And I, I think that um, most things have some sort of utility for some people in some circumstances. And you just got to find if that particular thing or method or whatever you're looking at, if that works for you and if that's uh, in accordance to your current uh, needs and situation and circumstances and all that. The final takeaway from episode 15 is uh, going to be a kind of a mixed uh, a mixed point and it has to do with uh, synchronizing your diet with your uh, ancestry first and foremost and then the season we're in and uh, third with your goals of course. So when it comes to ancestry I'm not particularly convinced that uh, we should all just uh, follow up paleo diet or something like that but I definitely think there is something to 
eating at least something or some in a similar way to the to the way your ancestors or your at least your grandparents ate so for example uh, burger mentioned this uh, in our discussion too that if let's say your ancestors were from scandinavia and um, your grandparents have moved from scandinavia to italy or something like that or even your parents and you were born in italy does that mean that you right now you automatically discard the um, typical high fat high protein lower carb approach that perhaps Scandinavians would have eaten and um, you trade that for uh, pizza and pasta and all that that you might encounter in Italy maybe you can and maybe you will feel uh, well and perform well on it but um, if you don't then perhaps it should be at least one of the thi- one of the things you consider looking um, into your ancestry a bit and I know there are things like or services like uh, 23andMe that offer your uh, genetic makeup and uh, the percentages of where you're from and your ancestors and all that and honestly I'm not sure how reliable that is but if you have the money and you're not worried about the potential uh, confidentiality issues where your data I think they are allowed to sell your data something like that but if that's something that uh, interests you, you might give that a shot and see what you get and trying to, but at least for the short term, experiment with a similar diet that your ancestor would have had and see if that um, makes you feel better. In a similar fashion, um, when it comes to the season and um, more particularly related to the season wherein the length of the daytime essentially and uh, the duration for which the sun is out and I mentioned this uh, to Burger too that whenever we, we are in winter I just get um, less productive and um, I find myself uh, getting uh, sleepier sooner and more tired in the evenings whereas right now when it's uh, uh, late April and it's already a very nice weather here in Romania I find myself much more energized and I can continue working for longer and an extension to this idea is uh, again the notion that we mentioned in the podcast that perhaps you should challenge the conventional approach of parking during the winter and cutting through the summer and I understand the desire of wanting to look good and all that so that's why I mentioned in the beginning that it should also be synchronized with your goals and uh, what you're trying to get out of your diet and training but um, let's say aesthetics aren't really or going to the beach aren't really your number one priority then perhaps you should actually eat more and train more when the sun is out for longer and you can be more productive and just have a higher uh, energy flux I guess and um, see if that particular approach would yield a much better or at least somewhat better um, muscle gain or a muscle to fat ratio and then when the when the winter comes and uh, you just or at least I naturally tend to be more tired and not that productive not that active and see if that period works better for you and uh, you can try to lose some fat in those months so these were my top three takeaways from episode 15 and um, i hope you find them valuable and um, gave you some new things to think about so with that let's move to episode 16 which was released just a couple of days ago and i had the pleasure of having um Adel Musa on the podcast who is the creator of the very popular fitness uh, blog Subversity and what I like about Adel is that um, he doesn't take this extremist science-based approach and he only values what uh, science has to say but he also considers what practice has shown and what has worked for people over the years. So my first takeaway from episode 16 is going to be around the notion of insulin sensitivity and the false view some people might have with it that the more the better and if you could have unlimited insulin sensitivity then that would be amazing and uh, your gains would just skyrocket and uh, you would get leaner effortlessly and build more muscle effortlessly and all that and other has mentioned that uh, that's not necessarily true and um, utilizing something like glucose disposal agents or GTAs might not be the best idea because contrary to what uh, exercise does which sensitizes your muscles and improves local uh, muscle insulin sensitivity a GTA might improve systemic insulin sensitivity 
So basically, it also sensitizes other tissues, not just your muscle, muscular tissue. And that also means that your fat cells also become more ins insulin sensitive and um, they could potentially soak up, I guess, if I might call it that way, some of the nutrients or some of the calories you're, you're ingesting. And this could potentially lead to more fat gain instead of less which is what most people expect when taking uh, GDAs in hopes of improving their insulin sensitivity. And another reason why I'm not really a fan of uh, GDAs, and I've had a couple of people ask me about it, is the unregulated nature of the supplement industry. And if you're familiar with examine.com, then you probably have heard of Kamal Patel. And Kamal is one of the few people that um, whenever he, he speaks on podcasts and whatnot, he warns listeners to be cautious of their supplements stacks and don't just start popping random pills and especially don't stack supplement upon supplement upon supplement. And GT is definitely fall into that category that, that isn't really well researched especially if you take a combo of, of multiple compounds, you don't really know what you're getting and there's a risk that you might be getting something that isn't supposed to be there and cause yourself some long-term harm. Now again, I'm not saying that is definitely the case. I'm not saying that people who sell GTAs are putting steroids into your pills and whatnot. I'm definitely not saying that. However, I am saying that the supplement industry isn't well regulated and there is a possibility that that could happen and i'm just not comfortable taking that risk especially when the potential returns are not really that noteworthy and um, especially considering the non-local effects that they could provide point number two is around the topic of fat intake and choosing your fat sources so for a long time i have been a proponent of having nutrient dense fat sources and instead of looking at particular um, fatty acid compositions and trying to choose that kind of fatty acid or this kind of fatty acid and demonizing saturated fat or unsaturated fat or this or that I'm just looking at fat sources and um, what kind of nutrients they contain so what you're going to find is that if you choose mostly nutrient dense fat sources you're going to get a ton of vitamins, ton of minerals, and what you're going to find is that the fatty acid ratio is a pretty even one and a pretty balanced one. If you stick to mostly those nutrient dense sources, you're going to get some amount of saturated fat, some amounts of monounsaturated fat, and a slightly lower amount of polyunsaturated fats. So I am definitely not a fan of either chugging down butter which is extremely high in saturated fat, or chugging down vegetable oils such as sunflower oil, or um, even something like canola oil, which would be considered by many a healthy fat source. I'm just, I just don't see the value in that. They don't really provide anything useful. They don't really have nutrients in them. They are not satiating. They are very, very high in calories. So I think they are best, maybe if not avoided, but at least minimized. So I wouldn't suggest, I definitely wouldn't go out of my way to make sure I put butter on my, well, butter in my coffee or um, drizzle vegetable oils on my salads. Not even olive oil, which is probably the healthiest choice of all the oils out there. So if any of my clients are listening to this, they know that I usually prescribe higher fat uh, rest days and it's not necessarily to somehow improve insulin sensitivity or all that or to compensate for the higher carb workout days even though that is one of the reasons I keep in the back of my mind the most important or the primary reason I do that is to ensure a higher micronutrient intake so Whenever I do that recommendation, I also make sure to note that the purpose of uh, having a higher fat rest day is so that you can choose food choices that are um, perhaps higher in fat, but are also nutrient dense. So again, if uh, we take something like whole eggs, which have been demonized for decades, but um, are probably one of the healthiest foods you can eat. Yes, the yolk has cholesterol and all that, but it's also very high in, uh, in micronutrients. So if you look at the whole egg, you'll find that most of the micronutrients are contained by the yolk and not the egg white. 
egg white has mainly water and protein which is great but if you want a bit more than that then you should also consume it and uh, with the recent uh, price increase here in Romania it, it has even become a kind of a meme to point out that well eggs have become such a valuable food asset that I can't really afford to just throw the yolk out like I used to do in the past so what I do these days is, is instead of uh, having more eggs, having 10 eggs and just having the egg whites, I'd much rather have 5 whole eggs and eat the yolk too. That way not only get the protein that I need, but also benefit from all the micronutrients the eggs contain. So in a similar fashion, even though you might not afford calorie wise, especially if you're female and you don't weigh a whole lot in a fatless phase and have to consume a lower calorie amount, you can't really afford um, on workout days to have a significant amount of whole eggs or um, fattier cuts of meat or uh, whole fat dairy or something like that. What you could do instead is um, take some of those foods and eat them on your rest days. So as the name suggests, it's a rest day, so you're not going to work out, so you don't really need a whole lot of carbs. So what you could do instead is um, eat mostly nutrient-dense carb sources on your workout days and keep the nutrient dense fat sources for your rest days and that's the main reason why i suggest um, having a higher fat rest day the final point from episode 16 and the final point of this uh, recap episode is going to be around the importance of sleep not just for improving your insulin sensitivity but just having overall better health so sleep is one of my favorite topics. If you follow me on Instagram, you would have seen that I made a series of infographics for Renaissance periodization. I think it was a total of nine uh, infographics where I essentially broke down how a day would look like if you wanted to absolutely maximize everything that's related to your sleep, starting from the moment you wake up and ending with the moment you fall asleep. So if you're interested, Check out either my Instagram at SotakTME or check out uh, Renaissance Periodization's Instagram page at RPStrength and you're going to find those infographics there and you can start implementing some of them into your own daily life. But overall, sleep is one of my favorite topics to discuss and I will definitely have some of the top experts in the field in the upcoming episodes to discuss um, sleep and um, methods to improve your sleep quality and quantity the importance of it, potential implications for disease prevention and all that. But um, to stick with the theme of this episode, Adele has mentioned that if uh, you wanted to improve your insulin sensitivity, sleeping more and having overall higher quality of sleep is probably one of the best things you can do. So if you're not sleeping at least seven hours, I know that uh, most people are trying to be conservative and they are going to say that, well, yes, eight hours is the average, but some people don't really need that and some people can get away with less and that's just not my experience and i don't know maybe it's because i'm young but um i've spoken with many people and what most people find is that if you're training really hard and by that i mean that you're training more than three days per week especially if you're pushing the envelope and training upwards of five six even seven especially if you're training every day which is probably not recommended not necessary for most people in more situations but Let's say you're training five or six days per week, because that's definitely something that many people that uh, who are listening to this will do. What I find in my experience, if you're training five or six days per week, you need at least eight hours per day or per night, <laughs> to be more precise, to recover properly and to have optimal performance in the gym. And um, when I do six hard sessions per week, I find that not even 8 hours are enough and if I can sleep ad libitum, not have an alarm clock to wake me up, I find myself sleeping more in the 8.5, 9 hour range. So if you're training hard and you're interested in improving your health and body composition, I would suggest at least 8 hours of sleep per night with potentially more if you're training even more and um, you're in a calorie deficit and trying to perhaps maximize your particular results in that uh, in that situation if you can get eight hours per night or if you find yourself still feeling a bit tired you can try to incorporate some uh, naps into your day taking something like 30 to 45 minutes per day and um, having an afternoon nap especially after a workout i find that to be super helpful and with that i think we'll uh, end this episode those were six takeaways that i think will be helpful and um, 
will hopefully give some insight into what I consider to be the most uh, valuable things in the, these past two episodes. Before I close this episode, I just wanted to thank everyone who is listening to these episodes and uh, gives me a reason to do these because it has been an, an amazing experience for me having the opportunity to have uh, these awesome conversations with some of the top uh, practitioners and experts in the field and as you can hear from these summaries I do learn from these myself and um, whenever I edit these episodes and listen back I always find for something new that uh, I missed whenever I uh, was actually having the recording. So I hope you will have a great week and I will be back very soon with episode 18 of the Muscle Engineer podcast with a very special guest that most of you will know. But until then, take care.